Hey, thanks for coming back to the channel. In this video, we're looking at the PreSonus Quantum 2 Thunderbolt interface. And this is one that I think has gone under the radar a little bit in the last couple of years since it was released in October of 2017. It's a pretty unique piece of gear. And I guess when I first agreed to take a look at it, I didn't really understand what they were doing with it as much as I should maybe. So I just assumed that having looked at the 1810C uh, USB 2 based uh, interface that this was just a Thunderbolt version with some more inputs and outputs. They add those uh, optical inputs and outputs which allows for quite a bit of expandability over the USB 2 units. So I just assumed that was kind of it. It's just a nicer bigger unit. Uh, Thunderbolt 2 is not something I've kept up with a ton in the audio world in the last couple of years just because it's you know not the best thing uh, for Windows users to have to deal with and uh, I use a lot of Thunderbolt 3 and see a lot of uh, USB-C products in the video world, but just haven't really kept up with Thunderbolt 2 audio interfaces. So the deal with the Quantum 2, when we start looking at it, I'm going to go over here and I'm recording with it right now and it probably sounds pretty uh, rough in here just because the amount of traffic noise, but let's go over to Universal Control and open it up and this will give you kind of the first idea of, you know, there's something different here. Uh, from the other universal control uh, based interfaces that we've looked at in the past on the 1810C, on the Studio Live units. So you'll notice in the universal control software, there's no mixer, there is no DSP, there's no equalization, none of that. Uh, and the idea behind the Quantum 2 is that it was built to be fast, and they expect you to do all monitoring, all mixing, anything you need to do, like routing your microphone back out to the headphone amplifier, or back out to one of the additional outputs on the back for monitoring all of that has to be done in software which is kind of different and the way they get that done is through really incredibly tight integration with Studio One 4 and you look over here that when I open a project and I select this interface, it routes everything for me. And we'll look at that up close here, but you'll see my four analog inputs, all my ADAT inputs, my SPDIF, uh, the outputs to my headphone monitors, the outputs to uh, channels three and four on here. It gives you all of that already set up, ready to go. You plug it in, select it, start a new song, and you're ready to record. So if you've struggled in the past with routing or just feeling like you're not getting the most out of your interface, because there's so much to configure and you're not really sure how to go about that, they've really taken the guesswork out of that. And if you want to just plug in your interface, have a really good quality interface that allows you to monitor right out of your DAW. You don't have to run another program underneath this to control the headphone mixes. Uh, I love Mark of the Unicorn's way of doing things. They have a really nice mixer in uh, the products like the 896, but you have to have that running as well to uh, make a headphone mix. And in this, we're doing it all inside the DAW software. I'm recording to this right now. I'm monitoring back. I've tested just, you know, one mic with a number of waves plugins, EQ compression. I've put some reverbs on the uh, output bus and it works pretty darn good. I haven't had any cause for concern yet and it's really impressive. I'm going to have to test with a higher channel count and some, you know, heavier loads and things, but as far as a single musician trying to track overdubs would go, this is really quite capable. So for a quick rundown of this model, we're looking at a 22 input, 24 output Thunderbolt 2 interface with four recallable XMAX preamps capable of up to 192K 24-bit recordings, although the channel count does decrease as that sample rate increases. We've got very simple front panel controls and comfortable I.O. layout, uh, especially considering the smaller size of this unit. This is not a full rack space in width. A couple of nice features you might not be expecting are the almost hidden twist lock power input that takes away some of the worry of having that external power supply. The power button itself also has some RGB lighting, which not only looks cool, but it shows us the status of the word clock being read if we have any sort of an error or an unsynced situation and blue when it's locked in. It'll also flash purple if you go into universal control 
Let's jump back over there, and up in the top left, you can hit the locate button. And if you have a number of these units in one uh, setup, you can figure out which one is which by simply doing that, and it'll signal to you. So that's kind of handy. And that expandability brings us over to the Thunderbolt side of things. With two Thunderbolt ports, you have the ability to link up to four of these units for a potential 80 inputs. To make this much more seamless than it could be, PreSonus have made this unit and their companion DP88 mic pre, it's an 8-channel mic pre with optical outputs, work really closely in tandem, and both of those work with the same universal control software. So you'll see up here these other two rows are... Uh, input gain and 48 volt phantom power supply uh, switches for DP88 units. If you had them, uh, if you had this unit expanded with two DP88s, you would have control over them right there and they would show up patched in over here in your DAW, everything would be really seamless there. So that's an incredibly nice way to handle that. With all remote controllable, recallable preamps, you can adjust, save, and recall everything right from the same project file in your DAW. And this is a really big step forward from the disjointed way you have to go about recalling an entire session with traditional gear in this price range. Uh, normally you would not have any way to recall the head amps uh, uh, for instance, along with your project file, uh, let alone the routing and all that other stuff. So this is really, really seamless. If you set up a recording and you set up mixes and you set up your mix as you go along, it's going to be there in your project file the next time you come back to it, which is kind of amazing. Now, they've included with the Quantum 2 a copy of Studio One for the artist version, and I've been using Studio One for the, the full version now for a few months, and I've been really, really impressed with it. Uh, my day-to-day -day work involves uh, doing, you know, digital content creation, podcast editing, and then the few other things that pop up throughout the week sometimes, and it has been really, really fun to work with. I typically come from a background using Reaper a lot personally, and I work in situations with uh, Pyramix, uh, Merging Technologies Pyramix, and also uh, Pro Tools, Logic, and all of the other uh, usual suspects. And I have really, really enjoyed getting to know Studio One. It's incredible the integration they have with uh, this unit, specifically so far out of all the ones I've tried. So when you go to set up a new project, like I said, you go and uh, create a new song and that will allow you to select from a list of interface templates and you select the Quantum 2 and it just populates everything. It arms the first four tracks and you're literally ready to record. You've got channels one, two, three, four, uh, routed and armed everything all the inputs and outputs are already routed if you're a musician especially or if you're somebody who has struggled in the past with uh, getting your interface set up getting things routed and functional before you're able to do your work and that slowed you down or stopped you from doing work uh, this might be a really interesting unit to look at because all you have to do is select it and the software knows the rest you don't have to bother uh, configuring things which is really awesome now, going back into Universal Control, it is drastically simplified over the other iterations you might be used to, but it really does everything quite elegantly. You have remote control, again, over your preamp gain. Uh, I can turn this down, turn it back up. That uh, works just fine. Uh, on the front panel here, the front panel controls are super simple. So this is channel one. That's our level. You can see I turn it up. It turns up in both places. Hey, 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 hey. I'm going to put that back there. Uh, and you page across to channel two, three, four, uh, like that. Very simple level 48 volt phantom uh, supply switch. And that's indicated over here on the little meter stack. And that's pretty much it. The AB, again, uh, like the other unit we just looked at, the 1810, gives you an AB between your main output into the primary headphone output and an auxiliary uh, mix. So if you're a single musician working and you want to go back and forth between your mix for tracking and like mixing, uh, that's a really simple way to do that and other than that the the other interesting things you might not be expecting with this unit is uh, the inputs are auto sensing so when you have nothing plugged in to the front uh, you'll see up here I've got a 48 volt phantom uh, button there on channel one because there is a mic plugged in but with nothing plugged in on two it's blank 
3 and 4, however, give you that 48 volt phantom control. And the reason is that these are auto sensing, but the front two default to line level when they're unplugged. So you get nothing up in that 48 volt box and the rear two default to mic level. So you do see the 48 volt. I'm not sure really what the story is behind that, but they are auto sensing inputs. So pretty interesting stuff there. Other than that, we have meters and the really cool part here is we have an R. RTA, and this is a channel specific RTA and you can go in. So if I select channel two, you see it all die away. Channel one though, you can see whatever channel is plugged into any of your inputs, including the ADAT inputs. So that's really interesting. And you can look at any of your outputs. And there's all sorts of adjustments here for the window range and size and different modes and everything like that. And that could be something that's really helpful to you if you don't have another way to do this, or if you just want to take a closer look at whatever's passing through your interface going into your computer. This is a really nice feature. Like speaking from experience, it's nice to have some tools built into your tools. So that's pretty neat. And it's uh, right there in universal control. This video is made possible in part by our good friends at Electro Sound Systems. If you want to see what goes on at a real working live sound shop, their YouTube channel is for you. In the shop, on the job, and on the workbench, they're taking you along for the fun at electrosoundsystems.com. We'll take a quick look under the hood and excuse the background noise. I'm just throwing on a lab for this and I've got the windows open because it's a pretty nice day here today. <laughs> So I probably won't go any further on this one just because it's kind of pointless to take it out of the case uh, any further than this, honestly. Just wanted to have a quick look. See a nice big, uh, big heat sink around the Thunderbolt uh, ports there. And Thunderbolt sure does get hot. It, the ports on my MacBook Pro uh, get just screaming hot and it worries me sometimes, especially doing, uh, you know, ongoing things like running an audio interface over Thunderbolt or, uh, you know, going to Cat5 for like a Dante network. It, it does concern me a little bit how hot those get, but that's nice to see a really chunky heat sink there on the Thunderbolt. That's the PreSonus Titan Thunderbolt 2. Everything looks like it's you know built really well. Uh, again, not the most expensive name brand components, but otherwise they make a really nice looking uh, piece of equipment here. Everything's labeled really cleanly. I imagine if this had to go back to PreSonus, they'd be able to service it quite easily. It's very accessible. Uh, there's surely enough room to get in, take everything apart, and they've just got labels on pretty much everything. It's really nice. There's test points labeled, there are voltages uh, labeled. Looks like it's been designed to be fixed and worked on, and that's that's awesome. That's all you can ask for. And I feel like PreSonus is making a good effort in keeping everything really serviceable. This is a nice looking design. So that's a AK4413, AK5574EN. So we'll look those up, see what those are all about. And then the control panels are just two separate boards. Headphone and main volume is on this daughter board here. Uh, and the headphone jack itself actually is mounted to the main board. And then we're again off of a standoff to the controls here and the metering. So what's really cool about these, I will say, is that uh, these are like silicone. These are like really soft. So th there's no chance one of these is gonna break off uh, if it should get uh, banged against or take a hit or something. These are like a rubbery silicone material. Hopefully you can hear that. These are not a hard plastic. So they're more, uh, they're actually softer than these uh, rubbery kind of buttons here, um, which is kind of neat. Didn't expect that. Our line outputs again are on uh, another board here just to get the top two stacked above. That's a really smart design. You can see there just uh, standing that board off to get those up in the air to maximize the space. Again, this is not a full rack with unit and they managed to squeeze in MIDI, uh, two Thunderbolts, all this optical IO, SPDIF, word clock, 
four line outputs and the two additional mic inputs. So they've really jammed it in here. Again, keeping that power supply external is probably what would account for that additional rack width. So, you know, whether or not that's your preference, I kind of prefer to have a full rack width and an internal power supply. If I was choosing, if all else was equal and I had the choice between the two, I don't know if this unit, I'll have to look that up, if this unit can be racked, I would be pretty surprised if you couldn't, but I don't see an obvious way to put uh, rack ears on this. There's some more processing going on uh, down below in here with another one of these AKM chips. So that's an AK4115, AK4115VO, 4115VQ. 4115VQ on that chip. So we'll look up, see what that's all about. Yeah, I think we might leave it there. So that is a quick look inside the Quantum 2. Again, really well made, solid metal chassis. Everything's labeled uh, really, really nicely done if you're looking at it from a standpoint of repairability. Now, whether or not they would repair your unit and send it back under warranty or just replace it, you know, due to time constraints, I don't know. You know, a lot of manufacturers would do that. They would just give you a direct replacement and then go about fixing uh, these units as they can and selling them as refurbished. So I don't know which way they go about it. Honestly, I haven't had to return anything to PreSonus personally to experience that, but it sure looks like this unit was set up to do uh, some repairs on it. Yeah, I don't believe I am going to be able to do much more here without really going to quite some serious length. So I'm gonna leave it at that. So that's it for this first look at the Quantum 2. It's a pretty unique interface when you look at it in context of the software. I know a lot of folks have been really excited about the Studio Live mixers that we looked at, the Studio Live Series 3, and the integration with DAW mode between those and Studio One, and there was a whole bunch of uh, interest in that, which was awesome, along with the networked audio side of things with the AVB stuff that PreSonus is doing recently. And those are really interesting, but if you're a Thunderbolt user or or if you're somebody like me who needs simplicity and portability more often, but could also use that extra expandability on occasion, this could be a really interesting option. If you are at all up in the air on DAWs right now, you should check out Studio One and see if it meets your needs. It's a really, really nicely made piece of software. And if you're already using Studio One with a different interface, I would strongly suggest getting in front of a Quantum 2 yourself uh, alongside this, either at a trade show or in a store if you can find one that has it set up and check out the integration check out how simple they've made this because i think this is really really easier to work with for somebody like me than the doll mode in studio uh, live mixers because i generally just don't need the mixer i'm doing most of my work in the box and it's a lot of times it's editing and things of that nature and having just a really well integrated interface with that expandability and everything's already done for me in the routing uh, it just cuts down on the time it takes me to set something up quickly and get to work. So that's kind of a bigger value for me than a lot of the other features on the mixing board. So this really kind of took me by surprise. More to come on the Quantum 2. I didn't really think it was going to be a hugely interesting thing to look at as a Thunderbolt interface with expandability, but it really is. It's a super unique product. It does what it says it does pretty well so far. I'd love to hear what you think if you've tried it, if you've tracked with it in a high channel count, uh, multiple musicians, multiple headphone mixes. I'd love to know how you got on. And of course, what kind of computer system you're using. I'm testing so far with a 2015 MacBook Pro and it's been flawless. So let me know what your experiences have been and what you think of the PreSonus Quantum 2. Hey.